flip over in your Bibles or over into your app to Matthew chapter 19, uh, beginning at the 16th verse, uh, and uh, here we go. Then someone came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you call me good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all of these, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. When the young man heard these words, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, then who could be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but for God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of His glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many of you who are first will be last, and the last will be first." For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. When he went out again about noon and at three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found the others standing around. He said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go to the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those, who were hi those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage, and they received it as they received it. They grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me that for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. As written by AOC, right? You know, it's, it's, this is a difficult text. This is a troublesome text. And we don't like it, especially us in America, in the first world. We don't, we don't like texts like this because God is not just messing with our spirituality, is He? He's messing with our money. And you don't want to mess with American money. We are biting off a big, troubling chunk of Scripture today. But the troubling part is less the size of it and more of Jesus' meddling. Jesus likes to do that. 
Jesus likes to meddle with that. But that's the part that's going to be hard because Jesus, and, 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 and remember, these are Jesus' words. Uh, I didn't write these down. I, 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 didn't, I didn't preach these, these particular texts or I talk about these texts. Or I'm just preaching them. But Jesus isn't preaching. Jesus is interfering. He's, he's, he's intruding. He's interloping in the things that we have worked out very nicely. Thank you very, very much. I mean, we bought a car earlier this year. We didn't sit down and say to God, should we buy a car? That would be silly. We just bought a car. But should we have asked? Should we check with Him on some of those things? See, Jesus does that a lot. He, he interferes in our lives. He began meddling in the text that Adam preached about last week about, about the cultural God that we have of sex and what we believe about male-female relationships and what that's all about, divorce, the different aspects of what that looks like. And today, Jesus shines His light on another one of our gods as He says, can I see your checkbook, please? Can I see your budget? The ask begins, as we read, about it, with a young and prosperous man. Other than uh, other gospel writers, rather, call him a rich young ruler, which is where we get that moniker. Matthew doesn't. None of the gospel writers give him a name, but to better track him through this text, because if we keep referring to him to the young, as a young man or the man or something, uh, we might get lost. So, so let's give him a name, shall we? Let's give him a proper noun. Let's call him Richard, or Rich for short. As a well-to-do young man, Rich was likely held in esteem by his peers and by his community. He was invited to sit on boards and have his picture taken with with local community leaders. Rich epitomized and exemplified respectability. Rich was successful in everything he did. He went to temple regularly. He tithed. He observed all the holy days and all the holy feasts. He read his Torah every day. He worked the entire system and ended up winning. He probably approached Jesus that day with a, a modicum of chutzpah enjoyed by the young movers and shakers of the region. Jesus, he knew, was a teacher. And so, as a teacher, he, dwelt, he drew on his school experience. He knew that teachers always liked him. They always liked Rich. They enjoyed him, and they enjoyed his well-thought and well-put-together questions. Perhaps, he thought, Jesus would listen to him and his well-reasoned, well-stated question and put his arm around him and say to everyone, everybody, look at, look, at, look at this young man. Look at him here. This is exactly the kind of follower that I'm looking for. But when he asked, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Jesus' reply was, frankly, rather dismissive. Follow the commandments. Obey the commandments. Well, yeah, Rich thought. I mean, that's what kind of we're all supposed to do, isn't it? But this was not the depth that Rich wanted to take his question. Jesus' answer seems so shallow. So to deepen things, he thought he would engage him on, on, on kind of an interaction with Jesus. Which ones, he asked Jesus. Can you believe that Jesus, this great teacher that was supposed to, this teacher was supposed to change the world, only gave six of the ten? And not only did he only give six of the ten, he only focused on the human relation commandments. He never talked about, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no God before me. He didn't talk about the Sabbath. He didn't talk about any of that. He even added a commandment from Leviticus, which is not one of the ten. Love your neighbor as yourself? What the what? Well, Rich had tried to make this young Galilean teacher look good. Since Jesus would not take the matter deeper, Rich would do what people like Rich always do, make it about him. 
And so he puffed up to Jesus and he said, all of these I have kept, he said. Check me out. Check out my reputation. Ask my rabbi. You will find that I have all of my bases covered. Now, Rich should have stopped there. He should have just thanked Jesus, shaken his hand, and walked away. But no. He decided that he'd push things just a little bit further. All these things, he said, I have obeyed since I have, was a little child. What do I still lack? Translation, come on, Rabbi, this is too easy. Give me a tougher test. Trouble is, Rich's deep dive was disingenuous. We can almost see Jesus smile at him and look into his soul and then say, okay, okay, there is one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have, everything, and give it to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Sit in that for a second. Just, just think about it. Look around you. Look at the living room that you're sitting in right now or wherever it is. Take a look maybe outside your window or... Think of the car parked in your driveway. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. <laughs> Imagine what was going through Rich's head at this particular point. Be serious. Come on. Sell all that I have and give it to the poor? Isn't that a little bit extreme, Jesus? I, I mean... I've worked really hard to get where I have, am. And not only that, not only have I worked really hard, I have obligations. I, I, I have to sell everything? I have to give it away and follow you? I can't do that. I can't just pick up and leave. I've got a wife and kids to support. I have workers who depend on me. What are they going to do? I've got some big financial deals that are pending. Come on, Jesus. Let's not get all radical here. You're taking this a little far. Tell you what. How about I write out a really big check to help out the poor? <clears throat> Who shall I make it out to? But Jesus' words hung in the air. One thing you have, you lack. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Now, there is a reason we theological types think that Jesus said this to rich and seemingly no one else. We, we reason, we surmise that Jesus investigated rich's soul and diagnosed his heart condition. See, outwardly, Rich was doing all the right things. But inwardly, inwardly, his heart was worshiping his other God. He was divided. His possessions and his position were competing with God for primacy. He had surrendered his outward behavior to God, but not his whole self. In fact, the grammar of the Greek that Matthew uses here tells us that Rich was preoccupied with having. For, for Rich, having becomes almost part of his name, Rich the Haver, if you will. And what that means is, is that Rich did not have his possessions. They had him. Of course, our response to meddling Jesus lies in the question of, is this only for rich and nobody else? You're not asking me to do this, are you, Jesus? This is the same question that the disciples asked a little bit later while debriefing. In verse 23, Jesus said to them, I tell you this, it will be hard 
for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So obviously, they, this led the disciples, as it leads us, to ask that question. Who you talk about, Jesus? Astounded, they said, verse 25, then who can be saved? I love Jesus' response because it levels the playing field. It takes the ground to the cross as level because His response is not, yeah, you got to work on that, don't you? His response is, pony up, boys. His response is not these things. He says in verse 26, God's got this. For mortals, it is impossible, he says, but for God, all things are possible. And then in chapter 20, he placed a mirror before them and us, doubling down in a parable that we hate. It is a parable of socialism, isn't it? Stop and think about it. About a landowner who hires day workers for his vineyard. One group's hired early in the morning, then four more groups of workers are hired over the course of the day. At the end of the day, what does the landowner do? He pays everyone, even those who worked an hour or so, what Matthew refers to as the usual daily wage. Everybody who worked all day got paid the same as those who worked an hour. And we go, that's not fair. And Jesus says, exactly. And those who, who worked the whole day were not amused. But the vineyard owner said, basically, hey, did you not agree with me that this is what was going to happen? Did you not agree with me that this is what it was going to pay you? Would you just take and what belongs to you and go? If I choose to give this last to the last the same as I give to you, Am I not allowed to do and choose to do what, I belo what belongs to me? Or are you so envious because I am so generous? So the last will be first, he says, and the first will be last. The worker's response to the landowner, to the vineyard owner, unmasks what has been the universal response to this troublesome text about rich. Classically, we in the church interpret it as using what is referred to as particularism. Everybody say particularism. I knew you could. <laughs> you see, just as Jesus' commands in Matthew chapter 8, remember back in chapter 8 when a man comes to Jesus and says, Lord, I want to follow you, but my father just died and I have to go bury my father. And you remember what Jesus says to him? He says, let the dead bury the dead. Come and follow me. Jesus didn't mean by that, that that all family burials are forbidden. He meant that this particular guy. So too, this particular command to this particular guy, Rich, was given, and that command is not for you and for me. Phew. Now, there may be some truth here, but it's fairly impressive it's pretty impressive how fast we go from command to particularism, isn't it? Well, Jesus didn't ask that of me. He couldn't have, right? See, the problem is we don't ask the important question. I once saw a cartoon in The New Yorker that was, looked like this. It's got two millionaires sitting in their palatial digs. And one of them says to the other, we either need bigger needles or smaller camels. That's kind of where we are. See, the problem is, is they too are avoiding the important question. And what we have to do is ask that important question, which is this, what does God require of us? I said a few minutes ago that Carol and I bought a car at the beginning of the year. We didn't ask God if we should buy a car. We just did it. You know, we just, that's what you do, right? But what is, is the only difference between, between those rich guys that I just put up from the New Yorker and, and Rich himself and Jesus and the disciples 
and me? Is it just the trappings of wealth? Or is it possible that we're not listening to God? Are we looking for bigger needles and smaller camels? Or are we allowing God to look at our checkbook? Years ago now, Carol and I started a, a process that we would do to try to bring our budget into line, and that was this. We, if we saw something, let's say we go to Target and we saw a lamp. We really liked that lamp. It was a really cool lamp. We could be able to read the Bible by that lamp, right? We wouldn't buy the lamp that day because it was an impulse buy. We'd go home, wait a few days, and if we still really wanted that lamp, we wouldn't get down on our knees. We probably should have. We, we didn't look through the Bible to see if, oh, thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Ha-ha. No. We let, we let the moment take its course, or didn't let the moment take its course, rather. We allowed us to stop and ask the question, should we do this? And it worked for us because what we were doing is we were letting God look at our checkbook. And there were times where not buying the lamp, all of a sudden some expense came in that we did not realize was going to be there, and had we bought the lamp, we would have been in a little bit of trouble. And I'm sure you understand I'm not just talking about a lamp. We slowed ourselves down. We thought it through. You see, it is an incredibly important question to do this. We need to let God look at our checkbooks. We need to let God look at our budget. If we do not bring God into the budget meeting, if we do not listen to His voice in things of money, money will be our God. I'll say that again. If we do not listen to God's voice in relationship to money, Money will be our God, and we will either misuse the hell out of it, or it will misuse the hell out of us. There's an old Haitian proverb that says, God gives, but He doesn't share. What does that mean? It means that God gives human beings everything that we need to flourish. God gives us everything we need to flourish. There is no FedEx delivery truck that pulls up to the loading ramp of the earth and offloads the raw material that we need, everything. God created everything that we need for an iPhone 11. 12? There's a 12 now? <laughs> God gave us everything we need for an iPhone 12 at the moment He said, let there be. God gives us everything that humans need to flourish. But God is not the one who's supposed to divvy up the loot. That's our job. We are working with Him to divvy up the loot. We are working with Him. Are we listening to Him? The reason often or sometimes, whatever you fill in the blank here, that we don't do our job, the reason that we don't look for big, or we do look for bigger needles and smaller camels rather than maybe taking a look at what that parable means, the reason we don't give away more than we do, the reason we don't use our largesse to care for those who do not have is that money is our God and it does not under the lordship of the God. Now, if I'm making some of you feel uncomfortable today, I want to point out, I'm not making you feel uncomfortable. God, Jesus, preached this, not me. And let me tell you, there are some amazingly generous people in this church who give not just to this church, as, as important as it is for us to, to support this church, they give to so many other policies, so many other places. And I don't believe that God blesses us because we give away, but, but I think it, it, it begins to, to work in that way that we begin to understand it. There's a great book called Mountains Beyond Mountains. I put the, I put the, um, the link into the, the sermon notes so you can, you can read the book. It's a, it's a book about the life and the work of infectious disease specialist by the name of Dr. Paul Farmer. He has given his life to the treatment of and cures of diseases like tuberculosis. 
Uh, and it's, it's amazing, this, his story. I, I highly recommend you reading it. And in the book, it records an interchange between Dr. Farmer and one, his, one of his main financial supporters, the late Tom White. Tom was the owner of a heavy construction firm in Boston, Massachusetts. White was, was a huge financial supporter, not only of, of, of Paul Farmer and, and Partners in Health, but also of all sorts of other Jesus-y culture uh, causes. And one day, they're sitting together, and, and White comments to Dr. Farmer, you know, Paul, some, one of these days, I'd like to chuck all this, just give it away, and go be a missionary with you in Haiti. And Paul Farmer thought about it for a minute, and he said, Tom, in your particular case, that would be a sin. But didn't Jesus say, give every, sell all you have and give it to the poor? Yeah, he said it to rich. I don't know what he's saying to you. I barely know what he's saying to me. We don't know if that is our particular case. But here's the question. Do we even ask? Before we write that check, before we buy that lamp, before we buy that car, do we ask God, what do you think? What should I do? Do we know how God is seeking to be the Lord of our life? Or do we not even ask the question? And do we allow other things, sex and money, to be our gods? Jesus is a great meddler, isn't he? I mean, consider what we've seen the past few days of Jesus' life. The demonstration of greatness by using a child, placing a child between one of the lowliest people that, that in, in that culture, placing that child amidst his disciples. We've been told the length we should go for the lost. We abandon the 99 to go after the one. We've been told the length that we should go with those with whom we disagree. We've been talk, told about a kingdom of forgiveness. We have been told of the high place of women in that kingdom. And today, we have been told about the lifting up the poor and our responsibility, our stewardship of wealth and the wealthy. All of these teachings and all of these admonitions would have been shocking to a first century audience. What they are for us is demonstrative of an upside-down kingdom which cares for the lost, which cares for the broken, the poor, the hurting, the less thans among us. A kingdom that challenges us to ask to Jesus to come and be the fount of every blessing to us so we can be a blessing to others. Whether riches or our equivocation against this upside and down kingdom is a sin of omission or commission, the result is the same. How can we claim to fulfill the command to love others, which Jesus directly connects Rich's life to, when we live in security and wealth while poverty and misery are all around us. After all, are we not all a little rich? Let's pray. God, it is so hard when you move from preaching to meddling. It is so hard when we have to confront who we are and what we are. And so I pray right now that everybody who's ticked off at me would be ticked off at you. Because <laughs> these are not my words, Lord. They are yours. Let us interact with what it is you call us to do and who you call us to be. Let us ask the question before we pay the dollar. Let us seek to understand your, your wisdom with energy, imagination, intelligence, and love. Not be driven by fear, but be driven by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen.